to the spike, an epic journey through the brain in 2.1 seconds. My name is Nick Barraclough. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology here at the University of York, and I have a few technical notes before we start our talk this evening. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using, using the Q&A button on your screen. This is at the bottom. This is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any point. Should you have any technical issues, such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is going to be recorded, so you will be able to watch this again if you like. Sub subtitles are also available in this event. To turn these on and off, use the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So I'd like to introduce the speaker for this evening. This is Mark Humphreys. He is the Chair of Computational Neuroscience at the University of Nottingham, and he is the founding editor of The Spike, a medium online publication. So Mark, if you'd like to take it away, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming this evening. And thank you very much to the York Festival of Ideas for inviting me to talk and about my book. I'm just giving me moment to try and share my screen with you. All right, great. So let me talk about my book. So um, so my book is about, uh, about how neurons in the brain talk to each other. It's really about the, the brain's own language. And I really wanted to write this book because, as you no doubt know, there, is, uh, there are a lot of books about the brain, sorts of books about the brain, but hardly any of them touch on how the brain does what it does. So for example, you know, there are books about emotion, how emotions work in the brain, but they never touch on how the mechanics of the brain actually give rise to those emotions, give rise to those thoughts. So I wanted to write a book about how the brain works at the level of neuron, the level at which things happen. So tonight I'm going to tell you about that language. I'm going to tell you that language by taking you on a journey, a rapid, quick journey through the brain. I'm going to take uh, three different waypoints I'm going to stop at, which are highlights of the journey that I take you on at a richer, detailed level in the book. And on that journey, I'm going to tell you two things. So first, I'm going to tell you that that language is uh, really remarkably simple and yet formidably complex. And it's really simple in that the neurons everywhere in your brain use the same signal to communicate with each other. The, the signal is always the same everywhere we look. But it's formidably, formidably complex because that signal means different things depending on where those neurons are. And how that comes about is one of the big mysteries of the brain. The second thing I'm going to tell you about is one of the is the fact that myself, uh, my my lab, and many labs around the world, of course, have been pursuing this language of the brain problem, and in doing so, it's revealed many uh, really quite perplexing and interesting mysteries about how the brain works at a fundamental level. So I'm going to tell you about one of those this evening. And one of those is about uh, how the dark neuron problem, as I call it, about the fact there are many many neurons that exist in the brain that seem to do nothing at all all of the time, and why they're there is a complete mystery. So let's begin. So what is this signal? What is this spike of my title? To recap for people who are either the biology long ago or just interested in brains in general. So the brain. So your brain looks something like this, right? It's less pink and fluffy. It doesn't have eyes embedded in it, but that's roughly the shape of your brain. In your brain, in your brain is, of course, filled to the brim with neurons. Many, 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 many neurons. I'm sure some of you know how many. And uh, those neurons sending messages to each other are how you and I do anything. So those neurons passing messages to each other is how I'm talking right now. There are neurons controlling the muscles that control my jaw and tongue uh, to perform the words that I'm saying to you right now to change shape of my lips and so on. There are neurons passing messages to each other in your heads, which are trans transducing the sound waves into signals that mean the words that I'm saying. There are neurons passing messages to each other, which are letting you to see the screen with the little cuddly neurons and the messages on the screen. And throughout your entire day, neurons passing messages to each other have done everything that you have done today. Every thought you've had, every feeling you've had, every um, thing you've done it's about, has come about from neurons passing messages to each other. So if you want to understand how all these things come about, you need to understand the language they're using to pass these messages. And that's what my book is about, what we're gonna to touch on this evening. To understand um, what that message is, then we really want to know, we need to recap a little bit you know, how this works, what a neuron is. So, quick refresher, parts of a neuron, okay? So this bit over here in the middle, that is the body of a neuron. 
So obviously neurons in your brain don't have eyes on them, but nonetheless, that is the, the body of a neuron for our purposes. So a neuron has two important cables coming out of it. The most important one for our purposes is this one here. That's the axon. That's the one that sends the signals from the neuron to other neurons. And they are received by these cables up here, the dendrites. That's what the neuron uses to gather in the information from other neurons, the signals from other neurons. OK, those are the parts of the neuron. So what happens if I stick an electrode in the neuron here? So I stick an electrode in. This is an electrode. That's as good as my electrode drawings get. So if I stick an electrode in the body of a neuron, what do I see? What I see is a tiny little voltage signal which is doing something like this. And at some point, it rises up suddenly and does that. And this thing here, that is the spike. There's a sudden jump and crash of voltage that happens. It's all over in a millisecond or two. And it's that signal that appears in the body here and is sent down the axon here to the end of the axon to be sent on to the next neuron. So this thing appears here, transmitted down, and sent to the next neuron. So that thing is the spike. And why is it called the spike? Well, it's called the spike because if we zoom out a little bit, then when we record a neuron, we see something that looks like this, which also looks a lot like an ECG. The spike, this action potential, as those of you who've done some halo biology will know it, is the same every time it's sent by a neuron. It's the same pretty much every neuron. It's this jump and crash of voltage. It's either there or it isn't. So that's the only signal that neurons have to transmit to each other. And so that's the sense in which the language of the brain is really simple. The language of the brain is made up entirely of these spikes, these pointy voltage blips that are traveling down these axons to other neurons. Indeed, spikes are how neurons talk. Right? So the spike is created here, travels down this neuron here, and then it arrives at this neuron here. Okay? So if I stick an electrode in this neuron now and I record from it, what do I see? What I see is a little voltage going up and down like this. Right? And say that our spike arrives at this point, then what do we see in that, that neuron? What we see is that this voltage jumped a little bit. And that little voltage jump is caused by the spike arriving at its dendrites. Indeed, all of these voltage jumps are caused by spikes arriving at its dendrites. And at some point, enough of them turn up to make it reach some kind of threshold, and it creates a spike of its own. Creates a spike of its own here, which is then sent down the axon to begin the whole process over and over again. So that is how neurons communicate. That's the spike of my title. The spike of my title is this, this simple signal that neurons transmit to each other, which is either there or it isn't. So let's get a sense of scale. Okay, so I've told you there are, this is how neurons communicate. A quick question for you then is, how many of these spikes are sent in your cortex every second? So your cortex is that big folded sheet of neurons that surround your brain with the deep convolutions on it. How many are sent every second? Multiple choice question for you. A, is it 170,000? Is it B, 170 million? Or is it C, 17 billion? Moment of thought. So it's C. So 17 billion of these things are sent in your cortex every second. It will take a few million. And that's because neurons are so numerous in your cortex. There are about 17 billion neurons in your cortex. So it turns out there is about one spike for every neuron in your cortex every second. Now, that's not to say that every neuron in your cortex sends one spike every second. That just means that there are as many spikes as there are neurons. And we'll come back to that at the end. But that's the scale that we're talking about. We're talking about um, billions of these things appearing in your brain every second. So not only they're numerous, but they must be sending huge numbers of messages around the brain to each other. So let's talk a bit about what those messages are. Okay. So this is the bit where we now talk about how complex this language is, I'm just thinking about how simple it is. So the question we're going to tackle here for a while is, what does a spike mean? Okay, and we're going to tackle that by taking this tour, I promised you, parts of the brain. So here again is your a view of your brain, a slightly better 
technical view. So this is the front here. This is the back here. Okay, your eyeball sits about here, roughly. And on this tour, we're going to look at look at three parts. So we're going to start with um, seeing, like in visual cortex. We're going to then look a little bit about the role of spikes in deciding up here in parietal cortex. And then we're going to look a little bit about the spike's role in remembering information, short-term memory, up here in prefrontal cortex. All we're going to see is that these, as I promised at the start, these spikes, although they're the same physically everywhere, they mean different things in different regions. Right, let's start in the visual cortex. So the visual cortex is the bit of the cortex right at the back here, which is the first one to receive information from the eyeball, right? So you've got your eye and your eye is looking at some scene of something you're really interested in. In this case, as I'm really hungry right now, a scene of a uh, scene of some delicious cookies sat cooling on a rack and that you really like. So photons are bouncing off these cookies that are entering your eyeball, they're hitting the retina at the back of the eyeball where they're being turned into electrical pulses, these spikes and sent to the visual cortex. So the first neurons in visual cortex are looking at a tiny bit of this world. So if we imagine that we divide up this picture into tiny little pixels, like this little tiny white square here, then for every little pixel of the world that your eye can see, there is a group of neurons in your visual cortex that correspond to that bit of the world. So those neurons only get information about that tiny little pixel of the world. And they get information direct from the eyeball. So the information they get is really simple. So it turns out that what they represent is really simple things about the world. So we can tell that because what we can do is we can put an electrode again in one of these neurons, these neurons in this little tiny pixel here, and we can show that neuron a series of lines, right? So we can show it a vertical line, we can show it lines that change, we can show it all the way to a horizontal line and back to a vertical line again. Okay, so this is the angle of the line here. And while we're doing that, what we're gonna ask the neuron is this. We're gonna ask the neuron, how many spikes do you send each line that I show you. And what we see when we do that is something like this. That when the line is vertical, it sends essentially no spikes at all. And then as we rotate that line towards horizontal, it sends more and more and more spikes. So the maximum is that there. And as we rotate it back to, to vertical again, it sends fewer and fewer and fewer spikes. So to this neuron, in that little white square there, just looking at that little pixel of space there. A spike from that neuron means there is a horizontal edge in that little bit of space. And then you can imagine that that's true of neurons next to it that look at the same bit of space, but a neuron that has something like this as its response, while that neuron has its maximum response to an edge at that angle. So if we saw that neuron sending a lot of spikes, that would mean that would mean that there is an edge in that part of space at that angle, because that's what the neuron is telling us. And similarly over here, if we have a neuron that responds like this, then we would know there was an edge that's about that angle in space. So these very first neurons of visual cortex, they send spikes, and those spikes mean there is an edge of the kind of edge that I like in this part of space. Great. One of the big mysteries of the brain is how does the meaning of the spike change as we get further and deeper into the brain. So in the visual cortex, we know a little bit about that, how that happens. So I'm gonna try and explain that now. So these first neurons, right, they really like, they really like these really simple edges in space. In tiny areas of space, they're like different edges, different lines, different directions. Okay, so now, of course, we imagine that we're looking now a lot more pixels. So here we're looking at, say, a lot, nine pixels altogether. And of course, then there are correspondingly nine sets of neurons in visual cortex that each correspond to one of those. Each one of the bits of space, bits of the cookie, wherever it be the crumbly chocolate chip there or the crumbly black brown top or the bit of pear that's sticking in the top. So let's think about two of those pixels that are next to each other. So these are the two pixels here. And you have a neuron that is looking at the top pixel and a neuron here that's looking at the bottom pixel. Now it happens that these two neurons like different edges. So that top neuron likes an edge like that. So it will send its most spikes when an edge at that position, at that angle, appears in the piece of space it's looking at. And the bottom neuron 
Well, it likes an edge like that. It likes an edge at that angle at that position in the bit of space that it's looking at. So now we imagine, well, those the first set of neurons in visual cortex, okay? But those two neurons connect to another to another neuron down here. Right? So what does it mean if those two neurons send spikes to that neuron at the same time? What is that neuron then in turn transmitting to the rest of the brain? Well, what it's transmitting is to this. Because these two neurons have these preferred angles, types of edge, that means that when they send those spikes together at the same time, it means those angles and types of edge must be there at the same time. They must be both there at the same time. Which means that what this neuron is sending is actually information that there is a corner in that part of the world because it's combined information about the edges. And then you can see how then in the visual system, this can be repeated ad infinitum. So we can imagine that there's a whole bunch of neurons here, like this, that have different types of corners. And then the next neurons along, whoops, excuse me. The next neurons along, uh, we put together information about these corners. Well, then they can start drawing the outlines of things, or they can put together lots of straight lines to realize there's a long line here, or they can uh, put together lots of little corners, which ends up forming a circle or a curve. And then we have the outlines of objects, and we put together lots of edges like this. Then we have texture. So just by building up across many, many neurons, these spikes that first mean simple edges, and then mean corners, and then later will mean joins of corners, and then will later mean joins of lots of corners, or joins of lots and lots of little edges, and so on, we get more and more meaning about the outside world. And the big lesson to take away from this example is that the meaning of a spike comes not just from the one neuron that it comes from, but comes from many neurons that it comes from. So this spike only comes to mean a corner because there are spikes from many neurons that correspond to the bits of information behind it that mean there is a corner here. Okay, so the visual system is nice and simple of a way of mapping um, from what's going on in the outside world to the spikes we can record in the heads of ourselves and animals. What's a bit tougher is when we move away from the visual cortex and move deeper into the brain to understand what the meaning of spikes is there. Now it turns out that in parietal cortex, this bit here, we have a really good idea of that once we get there, spikes start to mean something about how we make a decision. And in fact, it turns out that there's a set of neurons in there that appear to, to send spikes that mean this is how much evidence that we have for a decision we wanna make. So let me explain how we built up that, build up that knowledge. Okay. So the decision we want to make. So everyday decisions are quite hard to model in the laboratory. So we tend to simplify them down to something that we can quantify. And one of the classic decision-making tasks that we have is this really simple dot motion task. Now many humans and many animals have done this task for decades now and have been bored to tears looking at it. But nonetheless, it's been very insightful as to how the brain makes decisions. So what the dot motion task is, is a series of randomly moving dots, generally in a circle like this. On this diagram, what's supposed to be shown here is that the open circles are where the dots started, the black circles are where they've just moved to, a frame later. And this dot motion task, your task is to sit and watch these dots moving and decide, are they moving to the left or to the right? And once you observe them from long enough, you then press a button that means right, a button that means left, or you look to the right, or you look to the left. One of those. Okay. So let me show you what it actually looks like. So here's an example of what it looks like when it's a really easy one. Okay. Well, some dots are moving randomly, but a whole bunch of dots are moving in the same direction. So this is one, this is an easy one. So hopefully you can see this. There we go. So as you can hopefully see, sorry about the janky repeated GIF going on here. You can hopefully see that most of the dots here are moving to the right. right? There's a few that are randomly moving around, but most of them move to the right. So that's really easy. So we can see pretty quickly, as soon as that appears, well, sorry, do that again. As soon as that appears, the dots are moving to the right. 
Okay, now let me show you a hard one. I concentrate on this one, hard one. Which direction are the dots moving in? Okay, so sadly, that was a trick question. So if I show you again, the dots are not moving in any direction at all. They're all randomly moving. There is no coherent motion in there. There's no answer. There's no right or left. But it turns out that particular stimulus is the, that we show is the most important one because that means that one is saying there is no coherent movement. So if we look at this one, there's a lot of movement to the right. Okay. So any neuron that responds to movement to the right will start being active, sending spikes to this one. Okay. So we can't tell there whether a decision about the movement to the right is because the like movement to the right or because they mean I'm deciding they're going to the right. Whereas in this one, when it's really hard, well, there is no preference either way for movement. So there's no reason why a particular set of neurons would be firing for the rightward direction unless they meant I am deciding to go to the right. So let me unpack that for you. Okay. So we're going to imagine uh, we're going to record in parietal cortex. We've got another electrode here. We're going to do that while, while the dot motion task is playing and it's being watched. Okay, so we're going to record in the parietal cortex and we'll record the spikes at a bunch of neurons. So what we're going to imagine is we're going to have a neuron in that region of parietal cortex and that neuron is something that uh, seems to respond, correspond to the decision to move to the right. Okay, so it is most active when the, the, the decision to move to the right is, uh, is available. Okay. So what we're going to see is if we recall from that neuron, and we we'll actually show, so we're going to show dots here that move to the right. So what happens if we put electrode into that neuron and we we'll recall from it? Here's my electrode. So what happens is that we're going to uh, look here from the time before the decision is made. So the decision is made here times zero. We're going to look at the about 600 milliseconds before the time decision is actually made. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how many of these spikes, these pulses, this neuron's going to send, so it's electrode in there again, this neuron's going to send in those two second milliseconds in the build up to the decision. So what you're going to see is this. So this growing and growing and growing number of spikes that it sends up to the decision is made here, and then suddenly it plummets down almost zero. So this then is a, a neuron that seems to be uh, indicating that there is, at these dots move to the right, that there is more and more evidence, more and more evidence that the motion is going to the right. A decision is made that indeed it is to the right, stops adding up evidence, returns to the base, to normal. So that's what that neuron seems to be doing. That's what these neurons in the parietal cortex seem to be doing. There seems to be, there's a neuron here, this one here, that seems to be saying, I am representing the decision to move to the right. And I'm adding up evidence for that in the term of my spikes. The spikes coming out of me mean there is more and more evidence for moving the decision to move to the right. So if that was true, then we should be able to find neurons that, whose uh, spikes mean I am the decision to move to the left. So this neuron here, say. So we're going to put an electrode in this neuron now. We'll play the exact the same task. We're going to again show dots that move to the right. right. And we're going to do the same thing. Look at the time before the decision, and we'll look at the rate of spikes that it sends out during these 600 milliseconds. What we see is that we see that, well, now we see is that the rate of spikes decreases constantly over time, which is exactly what we'd hope we'd see if our hypothesis was correct, right? Hope we see if this neuron here indeed was a neuron that says, here is the evidence for the fact that dots move to the, that this moving to the left, because see, in this case, where the dots move to the right, then there is more and more evidence against the fact that the dots are moving to the left. So now we seem to have uh, neurons that are accumulating evidence for a left and right decision, and whichever one reaches some sort of threshold here, that decision is then made. And indeed, we now have 
a um, couple of decades of work on this region of the brain, which has shown how you can manipulate these neurons, you can um, stimulate them to, to send spikes when they shouldn't, and then the animal makes a decision, even though it's not the right one, to show that these really are the causal neurons, the spikes coming out of them, stand for a decision that's being made and cause that decision to happen. Cool. Okay, so this is the last little bit of evidence that we have that this happens. And I showed you uh, an example of when the dots moving were easiest. So that's this one here. And when it's easy, because the dots are moving easy, then the, it's really obvious, right? It's really obvious that the dots are moving to the right. Because it's really obvious, it's really obvious to the neuron. That's why it's obvious to you. Because, so it's really obvious. So the amount of evidence is accumulating really quickly. And indeed, the number of spikes goes up really, 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 really quickly. But it's really hard. It's really, really hard, like this one over here. And hardly any dots are moving at all in any direction then it's much harder. It takes a lot longer to make a decision. And the reason it takes a lot longer is because the evidence that the neuron is accumulating, the number of spikes that it is sending, are going up more and more slowly. So these rates of how quickly it's sending spikes correspond exactly to our internal feeling of how easy and hard the task is, and seem to correspond to how easy and hard we expect us to accumulate evidence in favor of looking to the right or looking to the left. So in this area of the brain, spikes come to mean accumulated evidence. Where just a few synapses back, uh, these spikes men, these spikes men, little simple features of the world. So suddenly we've got this really complex thing right here. Right. Quick tour then of the, the last bit I want to talk about. That's parietal cortex, prefrontal cortex, talk about remembering. And this is where things get even more complex because they're not even now representing things that are happening in the world. They're representing things that have happened in the past. But keeping things in mind. So I'm going to tell you a little bit here about um, a little bit of work that we have done to illustrate this. So, so we're thinking here about, we know that prefrontal cortex has a, a role in this short-term memory thing. The thing where you, you keep a phone number in mind or you try and remember um, where you just you put your keys down a few seconds ago. That's the kind of thing we know it's involved in. And we want to know is, oh, we know that that bit of brain is involved in it, but how do the, how do the spikes carry information? Do they, do, can we really see in this language of the brain, this kind of short-term memory? So let's have a look. So we looked at this in collaboration with a team of people in Paris who are running some rats in a nice little wine maze experiment. So this is the experiment the rats had to, to run, right? So the rats started at the bottom of this wine maze and its job, was to run up the maze, let's check the animation works here. Go on, there he goes. Run up the maze and choose whether to go right or to go left. Make that decision, go to the end of the arc. If it chose correctly, then you got some reward at the end. So here, rewards seem indicated by this piece of cheese, but in reality it was chocolate milk because rats love chocolate milk. And all the while this was happening, um, there were lights either on or off at the end of one of the arms. Let's try and get on or off. What the rat was trying to do is it trying to learn the rule that gave it the reward. So in this case, the rule was simply go to the left arm. We had to learn that by trial and error. And the lights were completely irrelevant. And only later, when it had learned, I gotta go down the left arm to get my chocolate milk, did this, the rule get switched. So the rule was now go to whichever arm the light was on. And as you can imagine, that would be fairly confusing for us. Um, as you can imagine, that uh, took the rats many, many days to learn that new rule. So the interesting thing for us was that's, that's the decision they're making going forward, right? But in this task, once they got their reward sample, they had to turn around and trudge all the way back to the start in order to start, they had to make the next decision. They wanted to start the task again so they could get more reward, okay? If they wanted more chocolate milk, they had to go back to the start. And now rats, rats hate turning around. They really hate turning around. They just want to run forward forever. So that first bit where they made their, made their first decision, and they walked up like this. This is more or less in real time. It takes them about four seconds to do this. Quite a big maze. They run straight up, look, kind of left, right, run up the other arm. This walk back though, this took, uh, this took them on average about uh, a minute, a minute and a quarter. Some of the rats took four minutes to walk back this tiny little distance because they hated going back so much. 
that was really great for us because that, would, that meant that we had a lot of time to look in their brains, there's electrodes in their prefrontal cortex this whole time, and ask them, so what was he thinking about on the way back? All male rats, by the way. So what was he thinking about on the way back? What he was trudging back to the start, what was he thinking about? Could we see this short-term memory in the spikes? So we asked two, two simple questions. Could we see, in this case, was he thinking about the most obvious thing to think about, which was, did he get the reward or not? Did he get the chocolate milk? So was he trudging back being really happy that he got made the right choice and got the chocolate milk, or trudging back really sad that he hadn't got chocolate milk, was thinking about his life choices? So we already know that if we look at individual neurons in this area, we can't see a difference between these two. We can't see a difference in the spikes they send reliably between when it had just got a reward and when it hadn't got a reward. But when we looked at mini neurons, then we could. Let me talk about how that works. So imagine we recorded from just three neurons. In reality, it was generally somewhere between 20 to 50 at a time. We call from three neurons. And what we found was something like this. Take the three neurons, and in the case where the rat was coming back after having got a reward, after having happily got his chocolate milk, then it, the three neurons would give a particular number of spikes out during that trudge back. So this one, say, was giving three spikes, this one was giving one, this one was giving one, say. Okay. And what we can see is that when it's then trudging back after having not got a reward on a different trial, then those same three neurons are now giving different numbers of spikes. So this, this neuron is now giving one instead of three, this one's giving two instead of one, this one's giving two instead of one. So across the three neurons, there's a different pattern of spikes. So those three neurons, nice hypothetical example. So we wanted to know, can we see this reliably? Can we see that there is a different pattern of spikes between wherever it had reward or or not when it trudges back. And if so, that would mean that uh, we have evidence then that these spikes really are meaning um, something about its memory, about this thinking about the reward it just got. Right? So we just explain quickly how we do this. So we're gonna um, take our maze, right? We're gonna flip it on its side like this, okay? And we're gonna divide it up into five chunks. So this chunk here was where it got its reward, right? And it's trudging back this way to get back to the start. I've numbered them one, two, three, four, five in the order that it visited them on the way back. And we're doing that because what we're interested in is, uh, is the memory here? Is it here? Is it here? And how does it change as we go back to the beginning? Okay. So I'm going to drop that down there. So here's our five main positions on the bottom here. Okay. And what we're going to ask is, how well did we do, given that we say we recorded these take 20 neurons at a time, how did we do in being able to predict um, whether it had got rewarded or not from the pattern of spikes that it sent. How well did we do? Did we, were we able to tell that the animal had got its chocolate milk? And if we could, then we can say there's definitely a memory in there of that reward happening. So chance would be about there. So if we were just guessing every time about whether it got reward or not, then that would be, that would be there. We would do just slightly better than 50% of the time. So, but how did we actually do? Well, we take some machinery, machine, machinery of machine learning, that's a clumsy phrase, isn't it? Sorry, machinery, machine learning, and use it to tell apart these patterns of spikes between the two, between the not getting a reward and getting a reward. Then we actually do, at this first main position here, just as after it's got it, in fact, we can do really well. About 85% of the time, we can tell whether it got a reward or not. In some rats, in some sessions, it was 100% of the time, you get perfectly work out, which is quite phenomenal given that we were only recording about 20, 30 neurons in a structure that has millions of the things. And yet that's enough information to be able to tell that it had some kind of information about the wall it just got. Now as it trudge back to the start this way, okay? Positions one, two, three, four, five. Then what happened was that memory faded very quickly. So, so very quickly came that it was more or less the same as guessing was the ability to tell it apart, the spike patterns apart in terms of how, whether they encoded reward or not. So we could definitely tell there was a memory of a reward in those spikes in the prefrontal cortex. We could do the same trick then for direction. So we can ask, did the rat 
think about the direction it had just taken about its life choice. Did it think, oh, I went left last time, or oh, I went right the whole time I was walking back? When we asked that, it turned out that yes, we could, we could look at that memory the whole way back. So right from the base position one, the whole way is trudging back this way, right to the very end, then only then could we not tell better than guessing whether it had gone left or right. So it looked like the whole time the rats were walking back to the start, the spikes coming out of the neural prefrontal cortex were uh, uh, telling the rest of the brain, I have just gone left or I have just gone right. Right. Quick recap. So what we try to show you here then is that across different regions of the brain, spikes are everywhere, but they mean different things. So we've got visual cortex mean edges that position in space. We've got parietal cortex is evidence for a decision. And prefrontal cortex, these spikes mean a memory of what just happened. So, what I promised you though, to end with, is a little bit of a mystery. So I'm just going to take three or four minutes here to tell you about something that we don't know. Right? So all of this stuff here is about, clearly we've got these spikes out, these neurons, and we can relate them to things happening in the world. We understand a little bit about the language that's being used here, about the meaning of these things. But my favorite mystery about the brain is what about all these neurons that don't seem, that their spikes don't seem to relate to anything at all that's happening in the world. So I'm going to recall this in the book. There's a whole chapter about it. It's called The Dark Neuron Problem. So, so what I'm going to show you this very quickly. So I'm going to show you to really illustrate this is here is um, what it looks like when we record a whole bunch of neurons, in this case, in prefrontal cortex, in that same y maze task the rats are running. What you're going to see is appearing on the screen. It's going to see a whole bunch of spikes appearing. There's going to be a, a row per neuron, and each little dash on each row is the spike that that neuron has just sent. Okay. So what that looks like, it's going to go quite, pretty fast. It looks like this. So you see this barrage of spikes. This is in real time. Barrage of spikes appearing. Let me do that again. So you can see here, that's one neuron, that's another neuron, that's one neuron, and so on. Alternating gray and black, right? And every little one of these dashes here, that is a spike. Let me run that for you again. Loads of spikes appearing very quickly. Okay, so all you can see is the neurons up here, right? These are firing loads. They're firing so many that we can barely differentiate them. You can basically see the gaps between them, these little white dots. Whereas down here, this neuron, for example, here is a nice isolated spike here. And here's one, uh, here's one here, for example. Okay, but we see that there's a whole bunch of neurons at the bottom, these ones down here, which are sending almost nothing at all during the long period of time that this, these neurons were. were being recorded for. So these then are a hint of the dark neurons. So I'm going to um, quickly show, I'm going to skip through this part, quickly show you, I'll explain this graph in a minute. Right. So what you're looking at here, this is the bit. What we're looking at here is a whole bunch of brain regions, right? This here, for example, is the first bit auditory cortex. This bit, second bit of visual cortex, that's prefrontal cortex where we just were. Other bits of Cortex. Here's the primary motor cortex, the bit stripped down here, which controls, particularly my fine control of my hand. These are uh, same bits, of brain, and all of these uh, little, oops, all of these little histograms here, these things balanced up this way. Each of these is a histogram of how active all the neurons in that task were. So we've got a thing here where we've recorded an auditory cortex and a rat doing a listening task, right? different task for auditory cortex over here. So we call a whole bunch of neurons and ask, how many spikes were those neurons sending each second? So in each case, we can see that there are a few neurons, right? A few neurons, these ones up here. So um, each one of these little blips here essentially is a neuron, right? There are a few neurons that would spend lots and lots of spikes every second, 10 to 30. And indeed, across all of these different recordings, we see that 10% of the neurons Send more three quarters of the um, three quarters of all spikes or more. Right? So we've got this deep imbalance, which means that we have a bunch of dark neurons. So there are ninety percent of the neurons send less than twenty five percent of the spikes. So most neurons. So this is a count of neurons here. So this you can see then right down here these big bulging things which count up all these neurons here and here, where there are tens if not hundreds of neurons that are sending less than a spike every second, far less in most cases. 
And indeed, this is a little bit of a biased view because this is all recorded with electrodes. We do the same recordings with uh, imaging where we can actually use essentially video cameras to image neurons directly, just look at them. Then we can see every neuron and we can see how active they are. When we do that, we can see that most of them are barely active at all. They send um, one spike less than once every 10 seconds or so. So these dark neurons, neurons barely send any spikes. They don't make any sense, sort of evolutionary speaking. So your brain, as you probably know, your brain is uh, a vast energy sink, right? It uses roughly 20% of your daily energy every day, despite weighing only 1.4 kilograms. And that's the equivalent of having to eat two miles per hour every day just to keep your brain going, okay? So your brain's really hungry all the time, lots of it. Why then spend all this energy keeping the brain going if you have all these neurons which basically do nothing? What are these neurons being kept alive for? That is one of the big mysteries of the brain. So we have many possible answers. I'm going to sketch one for you here to, to close for you. One of those possible answers is whether dark neurons are just bored, bored out of their tiny minds. I'm going to cycle back here to our first visual cortex example. So this, oh, this tiny little gray square, this tiny little gray square is meant to represent one neuron's response to the visual world, one neuron in that visual cortex. So this is a, a way of showing that response to a simple edge. So that little white thing there, that's the edge that it responds to, okay? So it's at that angle, in that location, in the bit of the world that it cares about. And then we can look at others. Right, other neurons next door to it look at the same same pixel of the world they have different responses so that one likes an edge that sticks out about here this one likes the edge that just sticks into the picture about there and then we can imagine a whole bunch of those so each of these little squares then is the response of a single neuron all looking at the same little tiny pixel of the world all like different types of edges they're like edges that have different angles like this, like edges that are different thicknesses, like this, there's a really thick edge that are in different positions, up here, or up here, or here, say. And in some cases, that like them to be a little bit more complex, so they like them to be between two dark bits, say, or split by a dark bit, so that you have all combinations of where light and shade will fall around these edges. So each of these then is a single neuron's response to the stuff that you can see in the visual world in the same pixel. Now, who introduces this lovely lady called Jenny, apparently? This is Jenny. What these neurons are looking at is Jenny's teeth. Now, the thing about teeth is that in terms of edges, they're not very exciting. They're kind of rectangular. They kind of go across, they go up and down, right? So if that whole set of neurons, all this set of neurons here that have all these different likes of edges, different shapes and sizes and, and, and angles and so on, we're looking at Jenny's teeth then the set that would be sending spikes would be that set, because that's the only edges that they can see. And what you can see then is that most of those neurons, so you have a lot there, you there, means that most of them are sending nothing. They are dark. They're dark because there is nothing for them to respond to. So the visual cortex, that very first bit of visual cortex, we have an idea of why the dark neurons are there it's because there's nothing for them to respond to. But deeper in the brain, we have no idea what they're there for. There's a whole bunch of ideas in the book. So that's just one of the few mysteries, the dark neuron problem. There's a whole bunch of mysteries about spikes that have been revealed like, to us by trying to figure out the language of the brain. And all these mysteries are talked about in depth in the book. And thank you all for listening. And hopefully we have time for some decent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, I'm sure there's a round of applause out there, which we can't hear, a sort of dark round of applause. <laughs> the, the, we have a number, of, um, uh, a number of questions that have come through uh, with the Q&A. Uh, I think what we'll try and do is work through them sequentially. And uh, there's a, a lot of really good questions. So hopefully, Mark, you'll be able to uh, have a stab at answering some of these. So. Uh, the first question we had was, are these spikes quicker or slower depending upon the environment? Uh, 
Could our brains look different in the future, maybe, uh, as we continue to evolve and consume more rapid or short-term information? Quick or slow, I don't know. So um, there is a sense in which, yes, as in the speed of transmission of spikes depends on temperature. So um, yeah, so obviously one, one the whole reason that, say, cryogenic freezing works is that essentially you're lowering the temperature uh, of the body down to the point where the cells stop responding. So one of the things that stops happening, of course, is the neurons stop sending spikes. They'll start slowing down, slowing down, and then eventually it will stop. Um, there, but evolve in the, the different the future. It's a good question. So presumably, yes. I mean, there are um, there are already we already know there are big differences between people and in, in how fast spikes are transmitted. So because the also what makes spikes being sent quickly is that whether or not your axon has myelin on it, the big fatty sheath. So if it has the big fatty sheath on it, then the axon, the, the axon potential is the spike is sent really quickly. It's clear, it's, it jumps between the gaps in that fatty sheath. So the thicker that insulation, the faster the, the neuron will be able to send the information. But of course, it creates a lot of energy. It needs a lot of energy to, to have that axon sheath. So it's, it's preserved for really important transmissions. So we can now look at, we can now have the ability to use neuroimaging to look in detail at the sort of the, that, those, acts, those sort of myelinating axons, the white matter, if you like, in people's brains in detail, I can see that they are different between different people. So that implies that then those, neuro, those neurons send, uh, they're sending these, these spikes at different speeds. So there is a sense in which people have already got different speeds between the neurons in their brain. So, and indeed it's this, this thought that People with extensive practice of particular motor skills, for example, so we can imagine violinists and pianists and so on, or people who need a very fast reaction times, those particular neurons will be involved in those skills will, will become more and more myelinated so that they were, will send the spikes quicker. Indeed, uh, I got a chat about this in the, in the car with my wife last week, listening to an extraordinarily heavy rock band with a lot of double pedal drumming, imagine what it sounds like, this like, noise, right? And she was like, how does the brain do that? How can it send the spikes that fast that the, the person's feet can alternate that quickly to make that noise? <laughs> it's going, that's a really good question. So we want to assume that they have, um, that their descending signals from the motor cortex have got going down, down pathways right down to the bottom spinal cord and then all the way down to the foot are so myelinated, so thickly myelinated, that the signal will get down there fast enough to alternate the muscle contractions to do this at a speed that we can barely even tap out with our hands. Yeah. Fantastic, that's good. That's a very interesting answer. Um, we've also got a question on where do spikes end up? So we have this sort of pathway from, uh, from vision at the back of the brain and generally there is a sort of feed forward process. Uh, the question is, so where do they culminate? Um, could it take the form of a muscle response? So, yeah, so, yes, our classic view of the, of the brain, indeed, the, the sort of framework I use in the book is this idea of, yeah, that spikes evoked by some sensory information cause things to happen throughout, throughout the rest of the brain, and ultimately there is then some, um, some spikes from some motor neurons, either down the brainstem, ring the spinal cord, cause some muscle somewhere to contract. So obviously right now, you know, causing my hands to contract, causing my muscles to muscle my forearm to contract my fingers to, to make my lips move and so on. But one of the points I'm making in the book is that actually most spikes don't end up anywhere except in the brain itself. So most spikes, what they're for is to feed back to other neurons, that they're there to, to, to drive other neurons. And indeed, one of the things I get into quite deeply in the book is that a whole bunch of those neurons seem to, so those spikes exist just to make other spikes. They're just, they're just there to create this spontaneous spike and they have no effect on the world. Um, an obvious example of that is when we're asleep. It's obviously in our brain, when we're asleep, our brains don't shut down, but our neurons in cortex are vividly active. Right? Um, and indeed, in, even in REM sleep, you have, you're dreaming away, but you've got muscle atonia, so your muscles can't move. So, there's a whole bunch of spikes firing away in your head all the time during REM sleep, giving you this vivid imagery, but nothing is moving. So those spikes are just happening internally, creating those images in your head, those scenarios, um, rather than culminating in a muscular response. Fantastic. Uh, we have another question. Can't we decode from individual spikes since they fire differently too? I suppose this is a question you've talked about 
uh, counting spikes uh, in terms of representing decisions and representing visual information. Uh, what about what information is counted at the level of the individual spike? Yeah, so I guess that's the question. Yeah, so at some point I was talking about in prefrontal cortex, we are uh, it's a situation where um, we can we can see information transmitted by a lot of sp spikes from across a lot of neurons, but we can't see it in a single neurons. So um, it's fired differently too. Well, so it, any given neuron, uh, it's can send a different number of spikes to a different thing that's happening in the world. So we, that's what we talked about with the vision example where you see have a neuron looking at different edges and it sends lots of spikes to say a horizontal edge and not to a, a, a vertical one so if you saw a number of spikes coming out of that neuron you'd have a good idea of what's happening in, in the world um when we get to more complex situations in this case complex things like memory things that just happened we uh, can very rarely see individual neurons that uh, happen to be responding individually to say the uh, the reward of the animal just got, so whether they got this chocolate milk or not. And one reason for that is because we're up in the prefrontal cortex, of course, there are no neurons that are wired up to particular senses to do particular jobs. They're recruited during the task. They are made to, they're just pulled in to do the job that's needed to solve the task. So it turns out then that in that case, the, you, what happens is that we have the lots of neurons are recruited. So the, the spikes from lots of neurons are then representing information. And they, why they do that is because it doesn't have to be reliable then. If you look at an individual neuron, it doesn't reliably always differ between the two things you're looking at, whether it's rewarded or not. But across all the neurons, there's enough difference between the whole set of neurons in one situation or another that we can tell from the spikes alone what happened. Great. Um, we, we have quite a lot of questions actually coming through. And uh, we're going, I believe we're going to be removed uh, from this in uh, four minutes entirely. So, so we'll try and get in a couple more uh, questions in those time. I'm just going to jump down to one about the dark neurons, which has been one of the themes uh, of this particular talk. Uh, the question is, could some of these dark neurons be backup neurons for the more active neurons in case the neurons get damaged? That's that's certainly a possibility, yeah. So one of the many, many options is that they are there, there is a reserve force. So as I just kind of touched on, the, much of the, our situations we get into in the world are things that we haven't directly experienced before and we need to recruit resources to solve them. So we often, you know, even going into the lab, we get given these simple decision-making tasks to do that we've never done before. So we have to get neurons involved to represent various things that are happening in that task. And it's possible then that a lot of these dark neurons are sitting there waiting to be recruited into tasks that we just haven't given the animal yet or given the person yet to do. So yeah, it's possible they are a reserve, not necessarily because they get damaged. I mean, there are, we have so many neurons that you have to damage an incredible number in order to have an effect. And at that point, we have, you know, we have problems of dementia and Alzheimer's and so on. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly the idea of them being a reserve is certainly a plausible one. Uh, I think that answers, actually, there's another question about injury to the brain. Uh, is it the neurons of the spikes or the spikes that have to readapt? I think that's a related question, is it? Oh, yeah. So um, that's a really good question. So, yes, in terms of injury to the brain, then if we think about things like stroke, then that's when the neurons die. Or say in Parkinson's, where the, the dopamine neurons die, then the neurons themselves are lost. And... Um, so obviously the, the spikes they send are just gone. So often then what we think happens in, in plasticity cases where you recover some function is that other neurons are recruited to take over their job. They're now sending the spikes that those neurons would have sent. Um, but there are, of course, lots of disorders where the disorder isn't so much the neurons die, but they're just uh, uh, attacked or malformed. So Alzheimer's being an example where we think that the neurons get surrounded off by tangles of protein, which prevent them from firing properly. Many of them aren't dead, they just can't function. Um, so there again, it's it, lots of neurons have ability to, to adapt to a lot of damage before they finally stop firing. So we see it again, we see it in, um, we see it in Parkinson's disease. When you lose dopamine from a chunk of the brain called the basal ganglia, the neurons that lose the dopamine, they continually adapt to the number of spikes they send to compensate for this until there's so much dopamine loss that they send they um, are now in a state where they start causing 
the, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Well, that takes years, which is why we don't get diagnosis of Parkinson's until you've lost 60, 70, 80% of dopamine neurons because the, the neurons can adapt their spiking to this loss of dopamine. And I think we've got about one minute uh, in time uh, for, for just one more question. I'm gonna pick a, uh, a really hard one here. Uh, is there a relationship between spikes, intelligence and sporting excellence? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, more so. spikes more intelligent or um not not um verbatim no so obviously there are obviously there are animals which have got more neurons than we do it's just that their neurons are in the wrong place so the elephant has more neurons than we do but it's always the neurons are in the cerebellum the little cauliflower thing at the back of the head which seems to be involved in correcting controlling fine movement and the best guess is that the elephant has that massive, massive cerebellum because of its trunk, because the trunk has so many degrees of freedom, it's so difficult to control, that it needs this enormous cerebellum. And the rest of its brain is tiny by comparison. So I'd wager that the elephant brain in total has more spikes than the human brain because it has the cerebellum system bigger. Um, but it's, we wouldn't say that it was generally more intelligent than us. Obviously, it's better than using a trunk than we are, but other than that, no. Um, so the relationship isn't, is, I can't touch on earlier, it's not so much but necessarily the number of spikes, but obviously partly it's about the speed of transmission. There has to be an, S, uh, an element of um, which neurons send those spikes. So you know, we, we think that in terms of humans, it's the elaboration of prefrontal cortex in particular. So the more spikes you have in there is our current best guess for enhanced intelligence, but that's very much a guess. And as for sport, don't know. Okay, and on that, I think we're going to just have to call it a day with the uh, uh, with the questions. As I said, we're going to be uh, uh, kicked out, I believe, in about a minute. So I'd just like to thank uh, Mark for his time and giving such a fantastic talk. Uh, this uh, this recording of this particular event, it's going to be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the watch again section of the festival, uh, and you'll be contacted by email when the video is available to. Uh, to view. Uh, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Mark uh, Humphrey's book, The Spike, it is available from our partner bookseller, um, uh, Fox Lane Books. For more information on book sales, please see the festival website uh, or head direct to foxlanebooks, all one word, .co.uk forward slash festival of ideas. I do really recommend it. It is, I've been enjoying it over the last few days. It is a really uh, dramatic story of the movement of the spikes through different uh, regions of the brain. And uh, it, uh, you should enjoy it uh, uh, if, if you do read it. I, I think it's fantastic. So thank you, Mark, for your time. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you very well. Thank you for some great questions. Thank you.